people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. The yoga event is held here. Severe injustice and they should be stopped. We should raise our voices. Condemn this uh, brutal act. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Indian NIA burst major Al-Qaeda terror module. Several Pakistan-backed terrorist syndicates exposed in Jammu and Kashmir. And European think tank and human rights activists slam Pakistan at UNHRC. Pakistan-based terror group Al-Qaeda is spreading its network in India by misleading the youth and persuading them to carry out terror attacks. In a recent incident, at least nine Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists were arrested from the eastern and southern states of India. The arrests were made under a major operation that was carried out to put a halt to the vicious terror network which is trying to find grounds in India by influencing youth through social media. A report. India's National Investigation Agency thwarted deadly terror plans in the country by apprehending as many as nine Al-Qaeda terrorists from West Bengal and Kerala. According to the NIA, this was a Pakistan-based terror module and the arrested men were motivated to undertake attacks at multiple locations of India. The terrorists were directly in contact with Pakistani handlers and four out of the nine Al-Qaeda terrorists were planning to go to Kashmir for weapons delivery on the instruction of these handlers. After raids at multiple locations, a large number of incriminating materials including digital devices, documents, jihadi literature, sharp weapons, country-made firearms and a locally fabricated body armor used for making homemade explosive devices were also seized from their possession. Pakistan's overall strategy towards India is to export terror and carry out a proxy war, whether it is Jammu and Kashmir or rest of India. However, it has been exposed a number of times in the past many decades, and that has resulted in tarnishing its reputation across the globe, where it is now being called as a country which exports terrorism, not only in India, but across the world. Having received this rebuke over the past many year, decades, it has now changed its strategy and it is relying on global terrorist groups such as the Al-Qaeda. This is very evident from the revelations made by the recent module which the National Investigation Agency has unraveled and has a spread from South East India. The main controller of these Al-Qaeda sleeper module is based in Pakistan. The terrorist groups and the religious extremists associated with them have been exploiting advanced digital technology and social media platforms to run their terror business. The internet offers terrorists and extremists the capability to communicate, collaborate and convince. Therefore, using online platforms, extremist groups recruit members, gather intelligence and spread hate speech to accomplish mass-scale radicalization. In the latest arrest by the NIA, preliminary investigation reveals that the men were radicalized by Pakistan-based Al-Qaeda terrorists on social media, including Facebook. Experts believe that large numbers of Indian youths are being trapped through social media channels and it is the need of the hour to regulate them. 
social media is being used by terrorist groups which have a global profile such as the Al Qaeda and the Islamic State to indoctrinate youth across the world to extremist ideas and ideology and undertake acts of terror. It is now apparent that some of the youth in India are also falling prey to such tactics which are on the used through passage of the social media messages, ideologies through channels such as WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook and so on. NIA's anti-terrorism operation in Kolkata and Kerala comes just weeks after the agency had busted an Islamic State module in New Delhi. Abu Yusuf, the ICE terrorist who was arrested with about 15 kilograms of explosive also came in contact with the Islamic State through social media. Global terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State have been working in coherence to spread their wings across South Asia. For this purpose, the use of advanced digital technology has gained momentum in the last few years as major terror outfits have an active presence on social media. These groups use such platforms to easily reach out to youths and indoctrinate them or jihad or holy war. It is important that the social media channels should act more responsibly and undertake measures to ensure that such channels are thwarted, neutralized and not allowed to operate on their platforms. On the other hand, we have to educate our youth, make them aware of how the social media is being exploited to draw them into the nefarious ends of terrorist groups so that they no more get involved and entangled in this web which only draws them into hostile acts of terror despite their being not originally induced to carry out such actions. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, the terrorist groups are on recruitment spree by using digital technology. They easily mislead the youth and force them to commit terror attacks. Thus, it has become critical to closely watch threats emerging from online space in the region. Pakistan-based terrorist networks have stepped up their activities at the LOC to push in intruders, arms and ammunition and narcotics into India. In a big jolt to this network, the Indian security forces carried out series of operations this week following major Pakistan-backed terrorist syndicates like drug trafficking, manpower infiltration, supply of arms and ammunition into Jammu and Kashmir. The forces also carried out number of encounters to eliminate active terrorists from the valley. Our report. Jammu and Kashmir has remained at the target of Pakistan state-sponsored terrorism since decades. Be it deadly terror attacks, cross-border firing or indulging in narco-terrorism, Islamabad has not deferred itself from indulging into anti-Indian activities. A country that barely has enough to feed its own citizens is busy aiding and sponsoring terror groups to carry out terrorist activities in India. Recently, Pakistan's narco-terror operation received a major jolt when security forces seized large amount of drugs, arms and ammunition from both Jammu and Kashmir region of the Union Territory. While police in Kashmir's Baramulla district seized 6 kilograms of cocaine from four persons, the Indian Border Security Force caught 62 cages of heroin, arms and ammunition along the international border in our Rispura sector. Pakistan's ISI is using narcotics for terror funding to avoid being traced back. But to its much disappointment and humiliation, even the narco-terror network of Islamabad stands exposed now, as the Indian security forces have upped their arms against Pakistan's sponsored terrorism at all fronts. They are pushing in these drugs, one, to ensure that the younger generation of Kashmiris that are there, they get addicted to this. Number two, the militants who will push these drugs, they earn money out of it that saves Pakistan to send hard currency to them. And number four, once the younger generation gets addicted to this, 
they will be dependent and also following the dictates of their masters who are supplying the drugs. So, keeping this in view, the Pakistan army, now that it has realized that basically the militancy has failed per se, since 1990 they have carried it on and now it is on its last legs, have now started pushing in these drugs to so that to ensure that the entire generation of young Kashmiris get addicted to this and therefore fall prey to it. In another operation, police in northern Rajouri district of Jammu and Kashmir arrested three persons affiliated to Pakistan-based terrorist group Lashkar-e-Taiba and recovered four AK-56 rifles, two pistols, four grenades and one lakh rupees from their possession. The recoveries and arrest come as Indian security forces also foiled an infiltration bit along the line of control as they detected suspicious movement originating from Pakistan's post in the area. A gunfight broke out between security forces and four to five men who were trying to cross the border but ended up running away from the spot. At एक ग्रुप जो है ये चार पांच लोगों का पाकिस्तान की तरफ से एंटर हुआ है और वो इसको क्रॉस कराने की कोशिश कर रहा था तो अलर्ट ट्रूप्स ने उनको चैलेंज किया है जिसके ऊपर उन्होंने फायर किया फिर जवाबी फायर में वो लोग भाग गए और ये कंसाइनमेंट जो है यहां पर छोड़ गए Islamabad supported terror groups are losing all grounds in Kashmir as along with bursting big terror rackets, the armed Indian security forces are also eliminating terrorist commanders in fierce gun battles. In a major setback to the ISI and the Pakistani army, over 500 terrorists have been eliminated in last one year by Indian security forces in Jammu and Kashmir. Continuing with its spate of eliminating terrorists, the security forces neutralized a terrorist in a gunfight in Badgam district of Kashmir. Experts believe that combined activities of drug traffickers, terrorist organizations and Pakistani state agencies constitute an escalating danger to India's state and society. See, Pakistan is never going to stop their anti-India activities for the simple reason being that when this Jammu and Kashmir state acceded to India, that was what rankled Pakistan because they said that being a Muslim majority state, it should come to Pakistan. But as per the India Act of Independence, the ruler of the particular state was authorized to go whether to Pakistan or to accede to India and Maharaja Hari Singh acceded to India. Therefore, Pakistan launched right from 47 till Kargil, it has launched various wars and it has tried to destabilize India by first funding and fueling militancy in Punjab. Then it has now come to uh, in the Kashmir Valley and this has been carrying on since the 90s. Since the abrogation of Article 370 last year, the security forces are aggressively working on to eliminate the roots of terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan already features in the grey list of Financial Action Task Force. And if it continues to finance terror outfits, the day is not far when it will be blacklisted for its support to terrorism. With no relief at sight, Afghan civilians and security forces are suffering from the brunt of escalating violence even as representatives of the Afghan government are having peace talks with Taliban representatives in Doha. Both the government in Kabul and the United States called for a reduction of violence, but the Taliban refused to commit to a reduction of violence until the terms of a ceasefire are negotiated and resolved deep mistrust exists on both sides of the table. We have a report. Taliban has not put a halt to an all-out offensive at the battleground. This week, at least 57 members of the Afghan security forces were killed and dozens injured in clashes with Taliban fighters across Afghanistan in the bloodiest week of fighting since the Afghan government and the insurgent forces began peace talks in Doha. According to Afghan authorities, multiple clashes and casualties were reported in the provinces of Uruzgan, Baglan, Takhar, Helmand, Kapisa, Balkh, Maidan Vardak and Kunduz. Statistics by the Ministry of Interior Affairs indicate that Taliban attacks have killed 98 civilians 
and injured 230 others in the last two weeks across 24 provinces. The Taliban has stated very, very clearly that if they stop fighting, what is there to negotiate about? When a statement is made so openly and they made this statement in Qatar, then it is quite obvious that the, the Taliban do not expect this agreement to be a precursor to peace. For them, this is an agreement through which they get the Americans out. Violence in Afghanistan is increasing much faster than the progress made in intra-Afghan peace talks where the negotiating teams of the Afghan government and the Taliban are still debating over the procedural rules and agenda of direct peace negotiations. Negotiating teams have been meeting in the Doha since talks started on September 12th but little headway has been made, particularly on a ceasefire. Despite international pressure, mainly from Washington, the Taliban continues to reject a ceasefire until the two sides reach an agreement. However, United States, which is aiming to bring home thousands of US troops from Afghanistan ahead of the November elections, seems to remain unaffected. Recently, a special representative for Afghanistan reconciliation, Zalme Khalizad, said in a statement that the U.S. will protect its interest in all circumstances in Afghanistan and that the Afghan people will suffer if there is no peace settlement. The Americans basically by saying that if they, the, the negotiations do not yield fruit, the Afghans will suffer, they have made it clear they wish to exit. I have no problems with the Afghan, uh, uh, Americans wishing to exit Afghanistan for obvious reasons. It's too hot. But the fact is they should not undermine the democratically elected government of Afghanistan or at least the polity of Afghanistan that is recognized and supported by far more people, the majority of the people than people who actually support the Taliban. These kinds of signals that the Americans uh, give by making such statements serves to create uncertainty. As part of their agreement with the Americans, the Taliban has committed to preventing terrorist groups from using Afghanistan as a base of operations. However, several reports have claimed that a large number of foreign fighters, including Pakistanis, affiliated with Al-Qaeda and other regional terror groups, still have cover in Afghanistan under the umbrella of the Taliban. Moreover, Daesh's Afghanistan wing, the Islamic State of Khorasan province and Al-Qaeda have been making constant efforts to establish a caliphate in some parts of Afghanistan. Pakistan will do what, it, what, it's, what is in its nature of the deep state to do, that is foment trouble. Will the premature withdrawal of Americans create problems? The answer is yes, it will create problems. But I think even if the Americans withdraw, but if they keep on giving full financial and material support to the Afghanistan government, people will find that the Afghanistan government is quite capable of defending itself, rebuffing both the Taliban as well as the Pakistanis. The rise of other terrorist groups amidst the constant bloodshed and grievances between the two warring sides can once again create a situation the country is seemingly coming out from and it could face a further crisis if the United States pulls out all of its troops before a settlement is finalized. Time and again, Pakistan has been exposed at various global platforms for being a terror breeder and for providing safe havens to terrorists. However, it once again faced grave humiliation at 45th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, wherein an European think tank and Pakistani activist slammed Islamabad for its gross human rights violations and sponsoring and exporting terror, despite facing strict regulations by the Financial Action Task Force. A report. Exposing Pakistan's terror sponsor policies, the European Foundation for South Asian Studies, a think tank based in Amsterdam, lambasted the country at the 45th session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Veronica Icklin, research analyst at EFSAS, stressed upon the fact that Pakistan continues to be a safe haven for terrorists and terrorist organizations. 
calling out Pakistan for hailing terrorists as martyrs, Veronica said that Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan and Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi have time and again confessed at international platforms that their country shelters terrorists. Talking to CNN in February 2019, Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi admitted that UN-designated terrorist and chief of Jaisha Muhammad Mazood Azhar resides in Pakistan. To BBC in March 2019, Mr Qureshi confessed that his government and Jaisha Muhammad maintained official contact. In July 2019, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan told the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington that his country hosts 40,000 terrorists. In June 2020, Prime Minister Imran Khan referred to Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden as a martyr in the country's parliament. Last month, Pakistan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs acknowledged the presence of UN-designated terrorist Dawood Ibrahim on its territory. Madam President, there is no need to elaborate. Pakistani officials have time and again confessed the country continues to be a safe haven for terrorists and terrorist organizations. The UN Security Council's consolidated list of terrorist individuals and entities includes 146 entries from Pakistan. With all due respect, I am compelled to ask, why is Pakistan still a member of this August Council? The situation in Gilgit, Baltistan and POK has become increasingly fragile due to the constant threat of terrorism perpetrated by Pakistan military. People in these regions are enduring one of the worst humanitarian crises across the globe due to the consistent atrocities being committed by the state of Pakistan. It is not just being plundering the land and resources of the region with impunity, but has been barbaric in muzzling the voices that demand justice and rights. Raising this issue at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, a political activist from POK Amjad Ayub Mirza said that people are now faced with the double colonization of Gilgit Baltistan as China has joined Pakistan under the Belt and Road Initiative. He demanded that this modern form of colonization must be declared as illegal. For every 25 people, Pakistan has deployed one soldier in Gilgit, Baltistan. Almost every single government official serving in Gilgit, Baltistan is Pakistani. Our natural resources are being plundered. UN resolutions regarding Jammu, Kashmir and Gilgit, Baltistan seem to have become obsolete, hence a new approach has become the need of the hour. Therefore, I demand that Pakistan be tried for war crimes that would that the world should collectively demand withdrawal of Pakistan army from our lands. A Truth and Reconciliation Commission should be set up to investigate the 1990s genocide of Hindu pundits in Kashmir committed by Pakistan-sponsored jihadi terrorists in collaboration with local Muslim clergy. Pakistan-occupied Kashmir is being used as a terrorist training field. The Pakistani army is complicit in providing funds and training to the terrorists being trained in these factories. Under mounting international pressure, Pakistan is now pretending to increase financial curbs on terror organizations by proposing legislations related to the FATF. These so-called financial curbs come at a time when several evidences suggest that Pakistan's counter-terrorism actions are a sham and it is still giving VIP treatment to many terror leaders residing in its territories. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Yeshi signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.